Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you all about accessible data and sound. I'm Regina Gilbert. I'm a, currently an industry assistant professor at New York University in the Integrated Design and Media Program that's part of the Tandon School of Engineering. So let's begin with some terms we should all get familiar with. Ableism. Ableism is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities or who are perceived to have disabilities. Ableism characterizes persons as, as defined by their disabilities and as inferior to the non-disabled. Ableism is systematic. The institutional devaluing of bodies and minds deemed deviant, abnormal, defective, subhuman, less than. Ableism is violence. So some questions to ask ourselves are, do you include people with disabilities in your design process? Are your design solutions intended to be used by your future self? And does your product promote an, an inclusive language? And this is from the designer's critical alphabet from Leslie Ann Knoll. The next one is assumptions. Our inferences and ideas are often based on assumptions that we haven't thought about critically. A critical thinker is attentive to assumptions, is attentive to assumptions because they are sometimes incorrect or misguided. So questions to ask are, what are your assumptions about the people and the context that you're, that you're researching? And have you double checked your, the truth of your assumptions? Bias. So bias is disproportionate weight in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way to be considered unfair. Self-correction against implicit or unconscious bias takes a lot of conscious work. So question to ask is, have you acknowledged your biases and tried to counter them by trying to understand the perspective of others? Justice, social justice. So social justice is concerned with the just relationship between individuals and their society, often considering how privileges, opportunities, and wealth ought to be distributed among individuals. So a question to ask is, how can you use your design concept to advance a social justice agenda? Marginalization. Marginalization is the process where something or someone is pushed to the edge of a group and is treated as insignificant or peripheral. How does your design disrupt the marginalization of people? If you work with marginalized groups, how will you ensure that the work is developed from their perspective and not your own? Self-awareness. So this is huge. Self-awareness is having a clear perception of your personality, including strengths, weaknesses, thoughts, beliefs, motivations, and emotions. Self-awareness allows you to understand how other people perceive you, your attitude, and your responses to them in the moment. The question to ask yourself is, how can you become self-aware enough to realize how self-aware you are not? Unlearning oppression. Some everyday practices seem normal and go unquestioned, but discriminate against minorities. Many well-intended people are unaware that their actions are oppressive. Oppression affects both the oppressed and the oppressors. To unlearn oppression, we must acknowledge our everyday oppressive practices and engage in critical self-reflection with the aim of becoming actively anti-oppressive. So the question to ask yourself is, what will you do to unlearn oppressive behaviors? And you, you play an active role in change and transformation. You have the agency to question what is happening around you and take action as a response. Design may be one form of response. Question to ask yourself is, what are the attitudes needed to be a manager, change agent, facilitator, or a researcher? So this is a, a great set of cards. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, I have a set of the, the cards created by Dr. Leslie Ann Knoll uh, called the Designer's Critical Alphabet, and they are available on Etsy. I think these are great to have uh, for every project that you work on, great questions to ask. 
Um, I know folks who use them uh, post um, uh, projects, so using them for postmortem. They're a great set to have and great questions to ask. So uh, I will be talking today about the Eclipse Soundscapes project. Uh, this presentation is based upon work supported by NASA under Project Eclipse Soundscape Citizen Science Project, award number 80NSSC21M0008, uh, in conjunction with uh, the Advanced Research and Inclusion and STEAM Accessibility Lab, ARISTA, and NASA. And on the page, I have an image of the Earth uh, with the moon uh, circling it. So I have an image here of the Milky Way galaxy and in which the solar system where we are sitting now is, uh, is situated. So there is um, a, a little arrow pointing to the sun and a little arrow pointing to you here. You are somewhere in this big Milky Way galaxy. And so I want to first talk about the sun and the sun's four layers. So on the screen, I have an image of the sun. And the first layer that is pointing to the center of this image is the core. The next layer is the corona. The next layer is the protosphere. And then there is the chromosphere. So this is not all the layers of the sun. There are many other layers, but these are the four main layers of the sun. Uh, on this uh, page, I have an image of the sun and the earth and the moon. And I'm going to go over what happens with a solar eclipse. So during the solar eclipse, the moon moves between the sun and the earth. The light from the outer part of the sun's atmosphere called the corona becomes visible during the total solar eclipse. In other words, the sun is hidden by the moon. Here I have an image of North America, uh, mainly focused on the United States. And there are two um, lines that are crossing. One is for the to total solar eclipse that is happening April 8th, uh, over uh, April 8th, 2024. And the other line is going to the annual solar eclipse that's happening October 14th, 2023. The lines cross in the deep heart of Texas, which is where I'm actually sitting uh, right now. So in 2017, solar astrophysicist Henry Trey Winter was asked by a blind colleague to describe what an eclipse was like. This led him to think about this question. If you cannot see an eclipse, how can you experience it? And here I have an illustration of, of a sun on the, on the screen. So when an eclipse occurs, the sound in nature and around you change. For example, many noisy animals go silent at night while others make noises. So there's crickets. There are frogs. There are birds, such as owls, and other birds may go silent. So October 14th, 2023, for five minutes and 17 seconds, there will be an eclipse. And on April 8th, 2024, for four minutes and 28 seconds, there'll be another eclipse. So the Soundscapes Eclipse project was originally kicked off in 2017, and an app was created which provided ads and iPhones in 2017. It featured real-time narration of different aspects of the eclipse time for the user's location. Here I have an image of the Earth and the Moon. Uh, the current project will last five years. Uh, it started in January of 2021, and it runs through 2026. And the goal of the project is to create accessible opportunities for citizen scientists to participate in real and meaningful scientific research that focuses on how eclipse affects life on Earth, specifically soundscapes. 
So here is a, a project overview. Act, does an eclipse have on an ecosystem? So from thinking about what happens in nature, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, and then there's going to be uh, learning objectives. So there are going to be lessons that folks can go through. The lessons will be using universal design for learning. And there will be citizen scientist experiences level one through three. There's a citizen science kit that I'm going to talk about a little bit longer. This will lead us to have some soundscapes data, which will provide us with informal science education and then uh, which will be accessible and soundscapes ec ecology. So what is the actual impact of the eclipse? So the basis of the project, it builds on expertise gained from the 2017 Eclipse Soundscapes project app that I mentioned earlier. It is made with, not for the blind and low vision communities, uses universal design for learning principles to create accessible citizen scientist kits and data analysis interfaces, and it leverages partnerships with communities. So I just wanna inform people of what universal design for learning is. A lot of folks um, who are not in education may not know about it. So universal design for le learning focuses on three areas, multiple means of engagement, which is to optimize individual choice and autonomy, optimize relevance, value, and authenticity, Multiple means of rep representation offers ways of customizing the display of information, offers alternatives for auditory information, offers alternatives for visual information, and multiple means of action and, and expression vary the methods for response and navigation and optimize access uh, to tools and assistive technologies. And I got this from the, the Michigan Techno Technological University. So the project partners, there's a lot in this project. Um, the project partners, uh, it all started with Arisa Labs. Um, shout out to Mary Kay and Trey, uh, who are from Arisa Labs. And the blind and low vision consultants, there are many of them uh, working on this project. The National Center for Accessible Media, the National Federation of the Blind, uh, NYU Tandon School of Engineering, that's my students and me, uh, Rainforest Connection, and uh, other social media experts, developers, designers, and science and education advisory boards. Keep in mind, this is a project that is lasting five years, so there are lots of different um, folks working on it. So in the spring, summer, and fall of 2021, NYU students and I began researching the citizen science project. So research methodologies used are literature reviews, interviews, competitive analysis, uh, content analysis, heuristic evaluations, uh, user journey maps, affinity diagramming, prototyping, uh, and usability testing. So these are a few of the problem statements that came out of um, the research. So the limited opportunities and poor user experience design with sound technology prevents all users from having a fun learning experience and engaging with accessible information relating to Eclipse impact on the environment. Uh, people want to learn and research about the impact of the Eclipse on soundscapes. They need an accessible education platform to visualize and analyze the sound data. People who are interested in citizen science especially those with visual impairments, don't have access to the necessary information and resources to learn about Eclipse soundscapes. This can be resolved by creating an accessible and engaging web-based app that provides a multi-sensory experience containing varying levels of information and data relevant to soundscapes. This web app will be successful based on the number and diversity of users. So some of the insights from the research were that simple language works best for the site, adaptable user interfaces tailored to the user's unique needs, for example, enlarging font size on the page, uh, skip to main content button, uh, quick, easy options to choose a sound recording from, um, able to choose recording from keyboard as well, a search bar to filter results, and voice accessible search feature. Other research insights, uh, high contrast images 
and text for readability. Use of text input from keyboard alphabet keys to navigate a uh, discover page compatible with text to speech and interfaces kept simple to avoid overwhelming the user. And we, we did some interviews uh, over the course of time uh, last year. So some interview insights were to make the design fun and engaging by including colors. Uh, make sure web application is accessible on tablets and phones. Give users opportunity to share with friends. High contrast images and text for readability. Uh, can use text input from the keyboard. Uh, compatible with text to speech so the user can use a screen reader. Interface kept minimalistic to avoid overwhelming the user. And some frustrations that people expressed about just using the web website web, uh, sites in general is websites with poor contrast or unique fonts or heavily italicized text don't work well and feeling left out of the science community due to a lack of access and resources so one of the things that i start with um, when i teach design and with this project in particular is for my students to focus on content first um, here I have an image of a content model template. So I'm just gonna go through what's on the template. Uh, this is for the a main page. So there are different boxes. So the first box is for the audience, uh, the purpose and the audience questions. The next box is for keywords, browser title, uh, friendly URL. Uh, the next box is for the page content. This is including titles and alternative tags. Uh, the next box is for images. Uh, the next box is for downloads and sidebar items and the next box is for other page, uh, other page content so i think it's really important and key even if you're not certain of the exact um content you're going to have you kind of most most folks kind of know what's going to be happening i think it's really important to start with a, a content model first so here I have an image of two wireframes. I'll describe the one on the left first and then the one on the right. So the image on the left is uh, an example of what the homepage could be. Um, it's likely to change from this a lot <laughs> since we've, we, I'll discuss in a little while. But at the very top, uh, there's a skip to content button. Uh, there's the, the, the name Eclipse Soundscapes. Underneath that is a search bar. Underneath that is an image of an eclipse, and uh, underneath that is the the words "What is uh, an eclipse soundscape citizen project citizen science project?" along with some lorem ipsum. Next to that uh, wireframe is our annotated wireframes. So one of the things we wanted to make sure um, with the students providing this information to the folks at Arisa Labs is that everything that we hand over is annotated with accessible annotations. So on the right-hand side, there are numbers that correspond to the, to the image on the left-hand side. So there is the skip to main content button. Uh, there is a button label, which equals a menu bar. There is a button uh, plus link, which equals a logo and the search bar and giving details of that. And there's also uh, the, the alt text, image alt text. So it's it's for when when students hand over and what what I teach is for students to hand over wireframes that have not only the you know the the content but also what accessibility what does accessibility look like and mean for uh, whatever it is you're handing over. So some research findings, what makes a website easy to use? Uh, obviously accessibility. I mean, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but hopefully <laughs> there's some new folks here learning some new things today. Um, so high contrast, uh, simple and clear layout, compatibility with native accessibility on Android or iOS, re reducing blue light and mobile friendly format. Additional research findings um, of what makes a website difficult to use is lack of accessibility, heavy italics, uh, text placed over images, unclear or ambiguous text, and difficult to find information. Some key performance indicators uh, that we, we thought may work are the percentage change in weekly visitors, the amount of time each user spends on the site, uh, an increase in users, the number of users who finish the lessons that will be provided and social shares. So now to the sound recordings. 
So a big part of this project, um, and, and I, I should have said that citizen scientists could be you or me or anyone. Um, a big part of this process is the sound, um, because if someone is uh, low vision or blind, uh, one way they can experience an eclipse is through sound. So on the left hand side, I have an image of a person holding uh, an electronic called an audio moth. So audio moth is a low cost, full spectrum acoustic logger based on the gecko processor range from Silicon Labs. Just like its namesake, the moth, Audio Moth can listen at audible frequencies well into ultrasonic frequencies. It is capable of recording uncompressed audio to a micro SD card at rates from 8,000 to 384,000 samples per second. And this is from the open acoustic devices. So I have another image, uh, same image of the um, so a person holding the audio moth. So citizen scientists will request and receive audio moths to record during the 2023 and 2024 solar eclipse. So the kit will contain one small cardboard box containing an audio moth audio data recorder, three AA batteries, and a pre-programmed micro SD memory card already installed, one plastic bag, uh, two 14 inch long zip ties, one bubble envelope pre-addressed to the Eclipse Soundscapes team with postage. So during the process of creating uh, the kits, it was discovered that instructions were not clear for how to put together the audio moths. And this led to the detailed instructions of how to operate the audio moth being added to the content of the website. So data sonification is the presentation of data as sound using sonification. It is the auditory equivalent of the more established practice of data visualization. So an example uh, applications of data sonification are astronomy studies of star creation, uh, interpreting cluster analysis, and geoscience. So here I have an image of the Rainforest Connection. Uh, it is the uh, landing page. It says RFC Arbamon, upload and analyze an unlimited amount of audio from your audio moth, song meter, or other recording device with our free cloud-based analytical tool. You're given an option to start analyzing or to learn more. Uh, it gives you the number of projects created, the number of recordings uploaded, uh, the number of analysis executed, and the number of species identified. So the Rainforest Connection is going to be an API that will be used by uh, the for the Soundscapes Eclipse website. In essence, people are going to receive the audio moths, they're going to upload those recordings, and those recordings will be ultimately uploaded to Rainforest Connection and then fed through to the Soundscapes website. So here I have an image of the sound summary. On the right side of the image is um, a photo um, imagery of the Southern Hemisphere. And the sound summary, this is specifically for the birds of Madeira flooded habitats, but includes the number of sites, the number of recordings, the templates, the pattern matchings, and the validated species. In addition to the sound data, there is uh, additional information. So similar to the, the previous image described on the right-hand side, there's an image of the Southern Hemisphere, and this is showing where the recordings are uh, for the birds of Madeira flooded habitat. So uh, here, there is uh, information for latitude, longitude, and, latitude, and altitude for each of the recordings um, uh, uploaded. So there's a lot of challenges of sound of data and sound with screen readers. So the organization of data must be kept keyboard uh, navigable. A data comparison needs to be simplified for screen reader use. And metadata, including sounds, can be a lot of information. And key information for sounds needs to be determined by individuals, which means there is a lot of room for error 
or misspellings or things of that nature. So here I have an image of, this is an example of sound data on Arbamon. So this uh, particular image shows um, in black and white the, the different ranges of sound um, on a scale. And on the left-hand side, it has recording tags, uh, species presence val validation, training sets, uh, the RF al algorithm, templates, which are the pattern matching analysis and soundscapes composition. There are other things also in this menu um, that I don't have on the screen. So the recommendations for research for data interactivity was to provide a fully interactive graph where a user can select any point along a line and it will tell you the time, frequency, site, et cetera. Uh, potentially there should be a, a tool tip or a separate table. Uh, filter data lines by site and differentiate between site lines and using, pat using patterns and color. Some additional recommendations are to select an eclipse phase to automatically jump to that part of the recording. Uh, click on, a fa on phase icons that automatically move to that part of the recording, um, adding keyboard shortcuts for field guide and tutorials for rainforest connection to help people figure out how to use it. So when it comes to the, the data and data sonification, data comparison and screen readers, uh, Leonie Watson uh, had a, a great quote, quote, there is a difference between keyboard and screen reader navigation. Although most screen reader users use a keyboard, not a mouse, they are not restricted to the same limited set of keyboard commands as other keyboard users. So in order to provide an accessible experience, data needs to be created in a way that works with screen readers. Uh, for example, tables with data need to clearly state what is in each column and row. So ways to make sound data accessible, uh, use an SVG format instead of an HTM, HTML image for screen reader use as it allows for users to access individual elements on graphs, uh, label axes and each tick mark for accessible uh, technology use, label each data point instead of using colors, and visuals need descriptive alternative text. Uh, provide proper titles to indicate the major insights, associate data cells with appropriate headers, identify rows and columns, and summarize the story of the information. So when it comes to storytelling and data, all of this, uh, the sounds that are being uploaded and recorded can tell a story. So citizen science data can tell stories of the changes uh, since the last eclipse, impacts of climate change on sounds, and unexpected changes in nature during uh, the eclipse. So some lessons learned from our research. Uh, we did some surveys last summer that did not work <laughs> at all, at all, didn't work. Uh, we got very few responses, but what did work were uh, user interviews, uh, doing the content modeling, uh, particip participatory design of the audio moth and incorporating um, folks who are blind uh, in that process, and working with the National Association of Accessible Media was extremely helpful. So I have a recommendation for all designers toolkits, uh, Demystifying Disability by Emily Ladau, uh, what to know, what to say, and how to be an ally. So learn about ableism and accessibility, disability etiquette and disability in the media, and how to be an ally. So our next steps for this project, it's an ongoing thing. Um, is the redesign of the site due to some technical constraints. So uh, we have some, some changes to make, adding accessibility features, field guide testing, column format testing, modal testing, uh, co-design of comparative data analysis, content creation for lessons uh, for the certifications and badges, and usability testing with the National uh, Federation of the Blind, which hopefully will be happening uh, toward the end of this year. So, this is my call to action. Um, we would like you to get involved. Uh, we need citizen scientists. I hear I have uh, an image of the ERISA Labs logo. 
uh, the RISA stands for Advanced Research in Inclusion and STEAM Accessibility uh, Lab. And NASA, is, RISA is in partnership with NASA. I have a, a NASA logo on the screen. So uh, you can get involved by going to uh, www.eclipsoundscapes.org uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can find us at Eclipse Soundscapes. That's E C L I P. S E S O U N D S C A P E S. The same uh, as for at Twitter, it's at Eclipse Sound U D L. And for Instagram, it's at Eclipse Soundscapes. So we need citizen scientists. Uh, so if you're interested, and being somebody who gets the audio moth recorder and records sounds and uploads those sounds, uh, we want you. Uh, the eclipse will be happening uh, next year and the year after. So if you're interested, please uh, reach out uh, to the folks uh, at Arista Labs. And I want to thank you. Uh, I am uh, Regine Gilbert. I also go by Regine, so some people will say, I'm saying your name wrong. You're not. Uh, I go by both. Uh, Regine is my birth name. And uh, you can reach out to me at rg1508 at nyu.edu if you have any questions. And you can find me on Twitter at reg underscore inee. -E. Thank you. Okay, so we should be ready to dive right into Q&A. And there's been lots of interesting questions popping into the Q&A. So I'm gonna dive into some of those, but if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to continue adding those. So let's start with one that came up uh, regarding universal design for learning. Have you thought about incorporating tactile sensations like sitting in the sun versus sitting in the shade for this project? No, but thank you for that recommendation. That, that's that's awesome. I have not actually thought about tactile because a lot of this is um, uh, digital, but that, that could be an additional component that we could somehow maybe incorporate. Thank you. Great suggestions coming through. Uh, this one has gotten a lot of interest. Is there a particular tool that you would recommend for annotating wireframing? Oh, so, I mean, my students use Figma, um, and there's some really cool, uh, there are, because um, Figma has a whole Figma community, and there are some, um, you know, templates that you can use for annotation, so I would, I would recommend that, because uh, that's what my students are using now. Great. I know you mentioned that sending surveys was a little bit of a barrier. It didn't work very well for this project in particular. So um, we got some questions around how did you send the surveys? What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so we um, basically I reached out to people that I know. <laughs> and I, I know quite a few people and I also sent it to people who know people. And uh, we just did not get um, a lot of responses. Uh, it was, you know, that's, that's the way it goes with survey. Like, I mean, anytime you're doing research, you just, it is a bit of trial and error on what will and will not work. Um, but I will say we, we just got so much more uh, quality information from actually speaking with people than, than the surveys themselves. So I'm not totally disappointed. Great. Is there any reason in particular that you think people didn't respond to the surveys? That was a follow-up question that came through. I think, I don't know, it was summer of last <laughs> year. And so I think part of it is we're still in this pandemic and who wants to answer questions about, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know if it was that, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping if we do surveys again, that we'll get more responses. I, I really would like to see more people like interested and involved um, with science? This is a great question. Um, is there a focus on school outreach for this project? Um, how have you been working on engaging with schools? So um, 
again, this is a huge project that uh, it's not just me. There's a lot of uh, folks and, and I'm, I'm really focused on more of the UX, uh, UI pieces of it uh, and not so much outreach, but actually one of the problems that my students have been given uh, this semester is promoting, uh, promoting this particular project. And uh, the focus is not just on students, really. It's, it's really on anyone who is interested in science, in Eclipse, in learning more about ecology and, and you know, the impacts of um, what could happen during the Eclipse. So we haven't done um, that type of outreach, but we, we're really more interested in folks who are just interested in science as a whole. Great. So another question came through, this project is focused on sound. So for users who are deaf, how do you help them really understand the, the information behind the sounds that they're listening to? I know you tapped into some of that in your conversation, but looking for a little bit more exploration there. Yeah, so for, for you know, the, 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 the basis of this project was uh, Eclipse soundscapes so that folks who are blind or low vision and cannot see an eclipse can, can experience it through sound. Um, for folks who can actually see an eclipse, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different experience. And for what we, we plan to have um, on, you know, with the site is, is descriptions of what the sounds are. And again, there'll be the data associated with those sounds so that information will be there. Um, and, and that's all I know at this point. Uh, again, this is an ongoing uh, project, but yes, there will be, there will be, um, you know, text to describe what the sounds are. Great. Um, we probably have time for one or two more questions. So this one came through regarding um, skip to content. So um, they were wondering if you had any other examples of utilizing skip to content and uh, why that might be useful. Well, I, I think it's useful. I don't, ha I don't, besides what I have, I don't have any other examples, but there's plenty out there on the web of skip to content. Uh, but um, I would say it's important especially with a site like this, uh, where there could be, you know, a lot of information, like this is a, this is a pretty big project. And so, you know, sometimes you just want to get to it. That's a, that's a point of a skip to content. It's like, let me just get to the main uh, focus of the site. Absolutely. Well, I'll close with one that is one of my own addition, but of um, what you found out so far, what has been the most surprising insight that you have gained from users? Oh, that's a good question. I think the biggest insight so far has been the, the importance of headings. I, I mean, I didn't realize how much uh, and how important they are, I knew, but I didn't know until I actually started talking to more folks and seeing how they interact. So that, that's probably the, the biggest learning for me and for the students as well, because a lot of them create sites and don't give things a second um, thought, but it's been very um, insightful. Uh, t talking, there's nothing, I will say this to end, there's nothing better than talking and working with people with lived experience of disability. That's, that's great. Well, no better note to end on. Um, thank you so much for your time and expertise in sharing today's topic. Um, I hope all of us take advantage of the call to action and take advantage of the opportunity to get more involved. So thank you, everyone, um, and thank, thank you, you particularly, Regine. Thank you. Thank you so much.